We are very pleased today to welcome Firos, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Dubai Airspace, uh, uh, with us today. Uh, DAE is the largest aircraft lessor in the Middle East. Probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but with the recent acquisition of AWAS Group, DAE now fe features an owned and managed and committed fleet of more than 400 aircraft. Uh, Firos is a seasoned finance and operating executive with over 30 years experience in managing complex global businesses. He's been chief executive officer of DAE since June 2013. Firos previously served as chief operating officer and CFO for DAE and he holds an MBA in finance from Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's degree and a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Bombay. Please join me in welcoming Firoz Tarapur. Thanks, Frank. Uh, and uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have to tell you this personal story. Uh, when we announced the acquisition of AWAS, uh, one of the conversations I had was with Frank, and at the end of it, he says, take good care of my company. So, <laughs> uh, so indeed, we uh, are paying good heed to that. Um, but uh, today, so uh, firstly, let me uh, welcome Wings Club to Dubai um, and say what a great pleasure it is to be able to give this speech at this inaugural event uh, in Dubai. I think it is events like these that continue to evidence Dubai's successful development as an aviation hub, not just in airlines, but in ancillary businesses uh, on the aviation side, on the aerospace side, and in finance as well. DAE is at the forefront of broadening Dubai's footprint in the aviation space. And I know that many of you are curious about our recent acquisition of AWAS and our motivation to do that. AWAS, uh, as you all know, has a 30-year uh, track record uh, in, uh, in the leasing space, and that was of significant interest to us. Today, I thought what I would do is guide you a little bit through our history and uh, Dubai's history in terms of a, an aviation hub, and uh, make a connection uh, between aviation and finance, because Dubai sits at the nexus of both aviation and finance. I hope that uh, at the end of the discussion, uh, we can um, clarify a little bit about our views uh, on the aircraft leasing industry, how we are likely to um, perform in a few years, and what Dubai is likely to do in that same period as well. So as, as I think all of you know, um, DAE was founded a little over a decade ago to begin the process of further broadening the success that Dubai had had in the aviation sector. So aviation is a major segment of Dubai's economy. Dubai has um, um, incredible success on the airline side, and now DAE was formed about 10 years ago to build on that. We, um, after exploring a lot of sectors, focused on two parts of the industry, leasing and engineering. Today, uh, what I want to do is focus the bulk of my remarks on the leasing side of the business, because that is the bigger side of our business. But our ambitions on the engineering side are just as um, aggressive, and we'll talk to them. So I guess one of the questions we, ask, we get asked is, why did DAE choose to focus on leasing from all these different things that we had identified and we could have done? For us, the answer is very simple. Aircraft leasing sits at the nexus of aviation and finance. Dubai, as I said before, has had incredible success in setting up airlines. But for those of you who may not be so aware, has had incredible success in setting up other ancillary aviation businesses as well, such as Danada, which was formed in 1959, Dubai Duty Free, which is now 30 plus years in existence, and Dubai Airports, which has been around for a very long period as well. At the same time, Dubai has also built uh, on its role as a service center and an economic hub for an extremely wide region. Dubai has done this by focusing on innovative tools such as the DIFC, 
which provides a legal and regulatory framework for financial companies and for a broader group of companies to do business in a certain way. So in addition to being an aviation hub in the Middle East, Dubai, we feel, is now unquestionably a finance hub uh, in the Middle East as well. And with aircraft leasing, straddling both of these sectors and providing us risk-adjusted returns that we deem are very attractive, that I think the, in the, the thesis behind why leasing, why Dubai for us was relatively clear. Now, it's true that there have been many new entrants in the leasing space in recent years. But I believe that DAE has set itself apart, and, and you kind of see where we are relative to where we were multiple years ago, by uh, applying a fairly diligent focus to how we make our investment decisions. We believe now that this is even more critical as we think about navigating life at this level, the challenges that now exist in front of us. Uh, I would argue that in this current industry construct, Maintaining that focus um, is even more important because the competitive dynamics of our industry have changed. But the attractiveness of the aviation asset base has not changed. And we would argue that, relatively speaking, that asset class continues to be of great attraction to us. Most of the new people who have come, new investors who have come into our business, are challenging some of those views. Is it a business that should earn the kind of returns that it has earned in the past? Or is it a business which is more appropriately solving for a much lower degree of uh, return on our capital? And we would argue that for the stress that we put our capital through, over time, some of these investors who are in here, some of these new participants who underwrite to a much lower ROE, uh, maybe fully don't understand the stress that our capital has to go through to earn the kind of returns that it should. And we think that some rationalization will come through for that, but not in an environment where the amount of capital and liquidity that we see in these markets is just at unprecedented levels. We have the great benefit of being owned by the Investment Corporation of Dubai, which is the main investment arm of the government of Dubai. And as such, we are not in this for the next two years, three years, four years, five years. If you look at the longevity of our other sister companies who have had long-term success in aviation, as we stand here at year 10, we're planning for the next 15 years. So we're planning for a much longer growth, a much longer um, investment horizon, and therefore we believe a much more rational set of decisions that can look past what is typical uh, uh, cyclicality in our business. Scale. Um, you know, as all of you know, our business is changing in a significant way. So first, the industry is growing. Consolidation is happening. But the number of new entrants coming in and the number of orders and commitments that all of us have made currently has fundamentally defined um, what we need to be um, in terms of scale to be successful. And we believe that going forward, uh, competitors who understand that, competitors who can proactively recognize that, will be competitors who will do really well in the future. And, and I'll give you some numbers in a minute. Now, if you look at just a few years ago, um, if you were a lessor with assets of 8 to $10 billion, that was absolutely fine. And that was absolutely additive. And with that scale, you could get all of the benefits that you need to be a successful lessor. You have the um, um, right relationships with the manufacturers. You have the right scale with the customers. You have attractive funding costs, suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. I think those things are still very critical to success. But I believe that at 8 to 10, that dynamic is completely changed. So as, as all of you know, when Avalon acquired CIT, we now have three players who are more than $20 billion of size in our industry. Um, we're at 14. But as we look forward, we believe that in the very near future, maybe five-ish years, maybe a little bit more than that, that there is likely to be 20 less wars who will each have more than $10 billion of receivable. That means that the scale at which we operate is now different. And if in this business where we have a very long tail of competitors, if you're in the number 10 to 25 uh, bracket, 
you have to think about how you make money. You have to think about why you're relevant, and you have to think about the long-term franchise that you have. So we feel that at least two or three out of those will move to do something that will set them apart and continuously push the scale of the top ten. If you're in the kind of the 25 to infinity bucket, you know, your life is even more difficult than you have a strategic imperative for you. Financially, I think everybody will make money unless people get caught in the title. But the question is, you know, are you tactical or are you building a franchise? And if you're building a franchise, there's a lot of work that I think people uh, will have to do. And I think over time, success will be defined by how people have established their position versus versus customers, versus funding markets, versus supplies. And if you can tick all boxes, then I think that will identify all of our, uh, all of the players who will be successful. Now, we've had, um, just to reflect back a little bit when we were not so large, um, you know, we have focused um, on our investment discipline. But I would argue that to be a successful lessor, yes, you have to focus on all of that stuff. But you also need to have a very good view about metal residual values. And you also need to invest in credit in a way that distinguishes you from our competition, from our own competition. Because that's when you make the most amount of money. If you understand something differently, if you take a position that's different from others, and a few of my colleagues here have demonstrated that really well over the years. And so as we um, invested in those capabilities to distinguish ourselves when we were smaller. We think that this will now be even more relevant as we get into a scale where we can't afford to be as selective as we were in the past and just focus on the transactions that matter. Now we're in the center and so we don't have the opportunity to say, okay, we can't play in that or we can't play in that. We have to maintain a presence that our customers and our OEMs um, find relevant. And we, be, we believe that with this scale and with this incredible platform that we acquired with AWOS, which is a credit-rich, technical-rich, finance-rich, but everything else-rich platform, combined with all of the stuff that DAE had invested in as well, that combination, I think, will help us a lot in distinguish ourselves in the future. So one of the questions we, asked, we get asked is, why AWOS? And if you look at where we were, we came from nothing to five billion in about eight or 10 years. But as we looked ahead, we found that the road ahead was untenable as a standalone provider or as an organic grower, because it would have taken us a decade, maybe more, to kind of get to where we wanted to go to in an industry that we felt was constantly moving to a different level of scale. And so when we um, saw the platform, uh, we came to a point of view uh, which I think is correct, that it was the last clearly available platform which would not only give us scale, but would also give us an incredible quality platform, people, process systems they needed to successfully manage that incredibly large scale that came along with that. So we put all of our resources to work on getting that, and ultimately, of course, we did. And what we have today is a 30-year track record of customer relationships, of processes, of people, of investment in systems uh, that creates a platform that I would argue is second to none. And, and I've made that uh, comment with our larger competitors in the room as well because it's an incredibly rich uh, process-driven platform over 30 years in my opinion. And some of the leaders who have been touching that platform are here with us today. Going forward, we'll be headquartered in Dubai but we will maintain a very substantial presence in Dublin and a very sizable footprint in the uh, areas where we already have a footprint. Asia, where we have a, a large footprint in Singapore, uh, and in uh, the Americas, where we have three locations, Miami, New York, and uh, Seattle. Now, when AWAS was acquired, or sorry, AWAS was owned by a private equity firm, um, that was not viewed as a credit positive for AWAS's story because um, there was a very strong bias uh, from the owner to have an exit strategy. Just everything that happened was driven around exit. And that focus, we think, um, leads you know, obviously to investments that are much, or investment horizon decisions that are much shorter in nature and probably not reflective of the growth and the investment that you need to make in a franchise. Today, 
the combination of BAE and AWAS creates a very different kind of platform. So we have the great benefit of a very strong owner who has a very long-term investment horizon. And as a result of that, when we put our strategies to work, we feel comfortable that we're not thinking about the next two years, the next three years, but we're thinking more about what a successful franchise look like in 15 years or longer from now. That's how we think about life. That's how we will kind of drive most of our decisions going forward. Our platform, I would argue, has some very unique um, elements to it, which will allow us to underwrite risk in a different way. Um, and as we uh, put our new uh, foot forward in the marketplace, you will see us do that, both on the discussions that we will have with the OEMs and also the discussions that we need to have with our uh, airline customers on the purchase leaseback side. And even though that market is difficult, AWAS has um, 125 customers in 58 countries, and it is just incumbent upon us to provide them the solutions that they need, which sometimes will be solutions away from the order book positions that we will ultimately have. And we believe that our risk platform and our um, every other capability platform we have will allow us to do that. I would argue that in addition to all of those, DAE benefits from something that no other lessor has which is our connection and our location to this incredibly vibrant, incredibly dynamic, and a strong economic hub that is Dubai. So if you look out at the city of Dubai today, it's easy to forget how quickly it has all come into place. 30 years ago, there was no aviation hub in Dubai. 30 years ago today, anything that you see today. And if you look at what exists today, what you see is a leading commercial and service center that operates in a region that is extremely large, all the way from um, Indian subcontinent to Africa, and, and this place acts as a hub for that. And so we see our location as a prime benefit going forward, despite the competition that we face from other centers who effectively lead their value props by tax savings. But nonetheless, it's hard to beat um, Dubai. In Dubai, uh, we're very close to the emerging markets, which are likely to, going, likely to be the growth drivers of our industry uh, in the future. There is Asia, there is Africa, there is the Middle East, even though people um, have a different point of view about the current state of affairs. In Dubai, we have access to a very innovative and a rapidly growing Islamic finance uh, sector. And that allows us access to costs which are competitive in, in ways that other sectors access other markets to do that as well. We would say that the local finance space continues to grow. And as Islamic financing continues to grow, we think that that will offer us a competitive advantage as well because uh, when local banks uh, expand their presence in the aviation sector, they generally prefer to do it with a, a local partner that they know, a local somebody who can help them guide through that. That is of enormous benefit to us. Um, I think in the last year and a half, if my numbers are correct, the Sukuk market has issued about $52 billion globally, and off of that, 30 some odd billion has come out of the GCC markets. And I would say that the, the non-Sukuk side of the side sector is also uh, growing incredibly well. Local banks um, are increasing their presence in this sector. So if you look at people who play in this sector today versus what we had multiple years ago, that's totally different. And that's enabled by, frankly, events like this and participation that we have in our um, storytelling that we do with our local colleagues. And when they see our success, and to see the returns and the security that they have in these returns, uh, that's a natural growth. But as it relates to our presence here, we believe that that's a good enabler for us um, as we grow our business. Uh, there's one other development that is worth noting. We have access, as I said before, to a very um, entrepreneurial environment, one that has fed um, and grown the Dubai International Financial Center. DIFC. So for those of you who don't know DIFC, DIFC offers a, a, a test, tested legal framework and a regulatory environment based on English law and allowing businesses from virtually any part of the world to 
um, conduct business here in a way that's standard, in a way that actually makes a lot of sense, as opposed to in different uh, local jurisdictions, etc. The IFC, I think, was the first financial center to launch a separate common law court and a legal arbitration system. And today, over 1,750 companies make their regional home in the IFC. And this includes lessors, banks, and the, the multiple legal and advisory companies that are involved in our airport uh, fin aircraft financing. I think more importantly, recently, the IFC has taken a step to introduce uh, special purpose vehicles and intermediate special purpose vehicles, structures that we use in our daily life in aircraft financing. And as we see those investments come to pass, we think that that further adds to the, the importance of Dubai as a hub for both aviation and finance. And we think that the DIFC products will actually be very, very successful in enabling us and others to, um, to operate from a jurisdiction that is new, fresh, and offers a different sort of benefit uh, to lessors. Um, we're also very pleased to see that other lessors uh, have chosen Dubai to be the regional hub, and I think that's kind of evidence of the incredible benefits that Dubai has to offer. So in that way, we think that uh, creating that community, creating that um, economic environment also uh, is a circle that helps build um, the success that we've seen in Dubai. I'm going to touch very briefly on our engineering business, um, which is currently a small part of our business. Uh, but as most of you know, that has been part of our DNA for a very long time. From 2007 to 2015, we owned Standard Aero, which was a um, global MRO uh, with about $2 billion of revenues. And we divested that in 2015 when um, it was uh, more of a financial asset than a strategic asset. In 2016, we purchased 80% of Juramco, which is an airframe MRO based in Amman and serves clients in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. And as we think about our own uh, future engineering footprint, um, it's easy to see how you can use Dubai as the hub around which you can build a branded presence in the engineering space in a region that for us stretches all the way from the Levant on one side to the Malaysian Peninsula on the other side. Now we're not there yet, but this is part of our uh, development uh, as a company and we intend to do that without taking anything away from the development that we have to do on the leasing side of our business. Um, let me just close by making a few observations. We are um, a seasoned player. We are a, uh, I would say we're not a fair weather entrant into the leasing space. And given our long-term patient horizon from our shareholders, our strategy will now turn to how to build a very, very long-term successful company uh, with the same disciplines that have helped us get successfully to this point forward. Um, I think it's two ways. We will benefit from the economic diversification that Dubai represents today. And in turn, I think that we will contribute uh, to the development of Dubai as a hub for both aviation and finance. So I'm going to end my um, kind of prepared remarks here and conclude by saying that it, it has been a thrill to be able to do this. Um, uh, Frank uh, and Tom, thank you very much for the opportunity. And then. Um, I guess if there are any questions, I will turn it over to you, Frank, to moderate that soon. So we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. If we don't have any questions, so I would I, like I won the bet. <laughs> if we don't have any questions, Firos, I would like to present you with a plaque small memento that reads, presented to Firos Tarapore in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club Foundation, Dubai, October 2017. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>